When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks a tidal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones are gathered to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Hello, my brothers and sisters in Christ. When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? I will. And I, and I believe if you're truly saved and born again, you're going to be there. Why did I sing this song? Well, we're going to get into our 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 expository study. So please open your King James Bibles, God's perfect written word in English, your King James Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The first verse of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 well, let us know why I sung that hymn, that old hymn. Okay. Now, keep your fingers here. As we move around, pause the video. We're going to be jumping all over the Bible and, do, and, and comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture as we do this expository study. But we're going to be coming back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 a lot. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together with Him. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, it's talking about, I believe, the catching away of the body of Christ. That blessed hope. All right? Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4.17, one book back. 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, to meet Him in the air. Now, brothers and sisters Christ, as we get into this expository study, I believe three things are going on, three events are going on. And we're going to talk about it as we go through here. You have, there's going to be a falling away, which we're seeing today. Then there's going to be the catching away of the body of Christ. He who now let will let till he be taken out of the way. That time, should, the time of Jacob's trouble comes third. Okay, it's the third next event. And the time of Jacob's trouble won't come until there come a falling away first, and then that man of sin be revealed. And we're going to be going through those scriptures. Okay, But you've got three parts to this event. You've got a falling away happens, then the catching away of the body of Christ happens, and then the time of Jacob's trouble happens. And all three of these events are being talked about in this chapter. And we have to rightly divide because some brethren are taking things out of context. And they're misusing it. Okay. So we see there, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, is talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. I broke this down in several parts. First part is that ye be not soon shaken in mind. Okay, why would, would Paul say this? Well, we're going to find out as we get through the scripture why. But we already know by verse 1 that Paul's talking about the catching away of the body of Christ. So somebody's coming in and messing that up. And that's what I believe, okay? 
Why did Paul say this? Because people are coming in saying that the bride of Christ is going through the time of Jacob's trouble. The catching away of the body of Christ doesn't happen before the time of Jacob's trouble. It happens halfway through. Or no, maybe it happens towards the end where we go up and come straight back down. Or maybe it doesn't happen at all. We just Everybody goes through the time of Jacob's trouble and Jesus comes down with angels, not saints. Well, you know, we already did a study on this. Okay, The angels are us, saints. Okay? But there's all these different false teachings. And they're coming in, and Paul's, it's like, why would you say this, Paul? Why would you say, be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled? Okay? I believe, brothers and sisters Christ, in First and Second Thessalonians, the prob- every book of the Bible, it's like the church has a problem, the body of Christ, and, and Paul's dealing with it, starting with uh, uh, First and Second Corinthians. They're fleshly, and God's having to deal with it. You're newly saved. You've got to start getting the sin out. You've got to, have to start your sanctification. You're a babe in Christ. You're going to have to start living for the Lord. God's going to start teaching you what, to, what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And you have people coming in teaching easy believism. You can just get saved and live however you want. And Paul really has to crack down on them. Then you get to Galatians where you have the church, the body of Christ. People are coming in trying to bring them back under the Old Testament. See, that each book has something, and I believe First and Second Thessalonians, as we get into this study, we're going to see that what's going on there with the church is someone's coming in, and they're telling them about the time of Jacob's trouble, fear-mongering, and getting them to believe that they might be going into the time of Jacob's trouble. As we get into this, if you fear someone into thinking they're going into the time of Jacob's trouble, they start to fear losing their salvation. Getting a little ahead of myself, all right? You have to endure, when, it, when you say that the church goes through the time of Jacob's trouble, you have to endure to the end, and then you shall be saved. So then you're not even saved. The, you're, you're not even saved. How do you know you're saved? Well, the Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You're also sealed, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. But when you tell people that they're going to be going into this seven-year time period called the time of Jacob's trouble, not the great tribulation. That's a lie. That's a false. That's a man's wisdom, worldly terms. We need to stick with the Bible. The Bible calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because God is done with the Gentiles for the most part. Not completely, but for the most part. And he's going back to looking to Israel, to the Jews, to dealing with the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Getting them ready for the day of the Lord. Okay. But like I said, you talk to them about going in this time period, they can lose their salvation. If you have it and you go into that time period, you can lose it. You take the mark, you worship the beast, in the time of Jacob's trouble, you're damned to hell. There is no getting saved. Okay. While you're breathing, you're damned to hell. While you're still alive, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more, while you're still alive and breathing, you're damned to hell. You can't get saved. Today, can we get saved while you're still breathing? Anybody can. We've talked about this. There's no unpardonable sin today. Okay, There's nothing that can prevent you from getting saved but you. Okay? Not you, brothers, but the, the world itself. Each individual person in this world, me. If I never got saved, the person that kept me from getting saved today is me. Okay? That's how it would be. But praise God that he humbled me. And I came to him broken and followed the true plan of salvation. And now I am sealed unto the day of redemption. I have that seal. There's no seal in the time of Jacob's trouble. You're not sealed unto the day of redemption. But you start fear-mongering people thinking that you'll go in there and you can lose that seal and you might lose your salvation and you might wind up going to hell. Then you have to start teaching false gospels. And it just leads to all kinds of doctrines of devils and heresies. But it's all about fear-mongering. And that's why Paul says, be not soon shaken in mind. And I like to point this out, Brother Christ, you also have people that believe, oh, the church is, the body of Christ is not going through that time of Jacob's trouble. But they're always looking at that time of Jacob's trouble, and they're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're all about pointing out that what's going on in the world is God is preparing the world for the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's all fear-mongering. Once again, you might believe the church doesn't even go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Are you looking for the time of Jacob's trouble? Well, yeah. Why? You're not supposed to be looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. What are you supposed to be looking for, brothers and sisters Christ? That blessed hope. 
what we just read in verse 1. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, with the life we're living, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. Jesus Christ could come back any day now to take us home. Sorry about that. Jesus Christ can come any day now to take us home. Are you living for Jesus Christ? Are you ready? Right. Um, 2 Timothy first, 2 Timothy 1, chapter 1, verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. In that time period, there's a spirit of fear. There is. Today, we're not, we're not supposed to have a spirit of fear. I'm sealed into the day of redemption. I'm looking for that blessed hope. Someday God's going to call me home in death, or He's going to call me home in life. And you might be new to this channel. What I mean by being called home in death and life is I might grow old and die, and God calls me home. I might have to go be a martyr for Jesus Christ and die for His Word if times can get a little bad before the catching away of the body of Christ. But I can get caught up in death, or I can get caught up with everybody at the same time in life at the catching away of the body of Christ. I have my eyes on eternal things, not temporal things. And there's a lot of verses on that, that the suffering of this present world can't be compared to what's waiting for us in heaven. Eternity. The temporal, well, this blink of an eye that we're living down here, whatever we have to go through is nothing compared to what we get to go through for eternity, brothers and sisters Christ. We're not given a spirit of fear today. But in that time of Jacob's trouble, turn to Revelation chapter 4, verse, uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. To take peace from the earth. And once peace is taken from the earth, and that they should kill one another... And there was given unto him a great sword. That's just one of the things that's happening. One of the biggest things, peace is taken from the, from the earth. And everyone's just after everybody. You're always looking over your shoulders. You're always fearful. There's a spirit of fear in that time period. There's not supposed to be a spirit of fear today. That ye be not soon shaken in mind. You have brethren that even though they, they claim to believe we don't go into the time of Jacob's trouble, they're so fixed on the time of Jacob's trouble. Be careful, brothers and sisters Christ, be careful of ministries that the whole ministry is surrounded, like end times prophecies, the whole ministry is surrounded by the time, it's about the time of Jacob's trouble, and ooh, and ah, we, we see the, uh, was it, the one world order coming into play, we see the one world currency coming into play, the one world religion coming into play, the worldwide economic collapse that will bring in the currency, and the worldwide, uh, Famine that's going to force people to take the mark. Oh, and the technology for the mark of the beast. And, 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 and the whole ministry is based off that. Be careful. I stay away from ministries like that. Okay? Why? Because it will distract you, brothers and Christ, from the mission at hand. Nothing's changed, brothers and sisters. No matter how wicked this world gets, nothing has changed. Our mission stays the same. We're to read our Bibles every day. We're to pray every day. We're to be part of the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to love our brothers and sisters of Christ and exhort our brothers and sisters of Christ. Men in ministry, we're supposed to be preaching the Word, not the world. Oh, look what's going on in the world. Look what's going on over here. What's going on here? Remember the Bible says when it comes to being a good soldier of Jesus Christ, we're not to entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life. You can get entangled and distracted and pulled away from what matters if you keep your eyes on the world. Remember, brothers and sisters, our eyes aren't supposed to be on the world. Our eyes are supposed to be on Jesus Christ. Okay? So peace is taken from the earth, and they are living in nothing but fear. Now, why would brethren promote fear-mongering? Oh, I'm not promoting fear-mongering. I'm just telling people how bad it's getting out there. We know how bad it's getting out there. How do, you know how, how do we know how bad it's getting out there, brothers and sisters Christ? Are you staying in this? Do you know this book like you should know this book? All scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
The world is against this. The world's way is always going to be contrary to God's way. You know this book, you can easily look out there and say, wow, this is wicked. This is wrong. This world is just getting worse and worse, and it is. It's getting worse and worse. I need to get busy living for the Lord. What are we supposed to be watching for? When the Bible warns us to watch, watch, watch. We're not supposed to be watching for the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to be looking for the blessed hope. Watching for our Lord and Savior to come back. He can come back any day now. I need to get busy. And it's a good thing. It's a good motivator. It's a strength. I'm not given a spirit of fear, I'm uh, but of power. Power. The Word of God. Power, love, and a sound mind. A sound mind. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 we read, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as dwelleth upon a woman with child. Remember this is in 1 Thessalonians. But they shall not escape. Someone's coming in here and telling the Thessalonians that you're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. No, no, the, the world as a whole that rejects Jesus Christ, when God says, hey, it's time for the time of Jacob's trouble, something has to happen. We're going to get into those verses. Something has to happen, and then we leave. We're not going to be here for it. We're not going to have to go through it. But someone keeps coming around trying to tell these Thessalonians, that, these brothers and sisters in Christ at Thessalonia, that you're going to be going through it. And Paul's having to go, uh, no, you're not. You're not going through it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, the next verse. But ye, brethren, remember it says, that they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Remember, that day can be talking about the day of the Lord. And as we get to the end of this verse, uh, the day of Christ. The day of the Lord and the day of Christ are not the same thing. The day of the Lord is when Jesus comes back on a white horse at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble to set up his kingdom, his thousand-year reign, the kingdom of heaven. The day of Christ is the catching away of the body of Christ. Now, the day of the Lord is going to be the thief, and if that doesn't overtake us as a thief in the night, then the day of Christ is going to happen to prevent us from going through that time period. Okay. Now, Remember what it said, uh, verse 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled. Troubled. Like I said, what's shaken in mind? Fear-mongering. You're getting shaken in mind. You know, we're going to get ahead of ourselves. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but... Or be troubled, or neither by spirit or by word. One of the things that can really shake in your mind is if you got someone coming along trying to talk you out of believing that you're saved when you follow the true plan of salvation. Or that the true plan of salvation, like in, the, in uh, Galatians, the true plan of salvation, yeah, that's good, but it's not enough. you got to keep the Old Testament Levitical laws. Someone comes in and does something to get you to think that you can lose your salvation, or you don't have it. That, that'll shake in you. Really shake in you. So John 13, 12. I'm sorry. John 13, 21. Troubled by spirit. When it talks about, what's an example of being troubled in the spirit? Let's use the greatest example ever, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So John 13, 21. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the one of you shall betray me. The twelve apostles are the twelve, uh, the people that stayed with Jesus Christ, they didn't deserve him. People always make Judas Iscariot out to be just evil from the beginning. No, he went, so at one point he went bad. There's no seal into the day of redemption in this time period where Jesus is doing his earthly ministry. Okay? He's came, when God came in the likeness of sinful flesh, okay? I believe Judas Iscariot started out good, loving the Lord and following the Lord and listening to the Lord. Uh, if you remember the verse, I didn't put it down here, but when Jesus is talking about his flesh and his blood, and he's talking about the sacrifice, that he, it's a future prophecy of the sacrifice that he was going to make on the cross. If you don't go through that sacrifice, you can't be saved. There's people that couldn't handle it. And all his disciples left him except for the twelve. The twelve stuck with him. And out of those twelve, he saw... He, the Bible kept saying how Jesus could see the heart. He knew man's hearts. This book also sees the hearts. Double-edged sword knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
He saw what was happening in Judas Iscariot. He saw him over time go bad. Give himself over to a reprobate mind. Okay. Wouldn't that grieve your heart? You have someone you love and care about, but they're going the wrong direction. They're heading for destruction. And no matter what you say or do, you, it's not going to stop them. They're going to just go for that, for that destruction. Proverbs 18.24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Have you ever had a best friend before, Brother Sis Christ? A best friend, a, a friend that's closer than a brother or, or closer than a sister for the sisters in Christ? Um, you had someone that you loved, you, you spent a lot of time talking to, you did things with. Best friends. You could be a man in ministry where you two of you are in ministry, like Paul and Barnabas, and you're trying to serve the Lord with all your heart, and you've gone through so many experiences together, you're like brothers. And then something comes along, causes division, and you go your separate ways. Wouldn't that grieve your spirit? Trouble in spirit? Oh yeah. How can a spirit be troubled when you lose someone you love and care about? You either lose them to the world, you lose fellowship with somebody, or you lose a loved one in death. I have. You've lose, you lose loved ones in death that are lost. There's no, more, there's no more opportunities to witness to them. Okay. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. But the trouble in heart that I believe is being talked about here, I want to use that as an example of being really troubled in the heart. But what I believe the trouble in heart here more than anything is this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You know what really would grieve you, if your heart and mess you up? Is if someone comes along and tries to talk you out of the true plan of salvation. Oh, there is no repentance. That's a work. Oh, there is no prayer. That's a work. I never understood that, brothers of Christ. If prayer is a work, you're telling me in the Old Testament, it was very clear on what works were when it came to the Sabbath day. So in the Old Testament, on the Sabbath day, nobody spoke a word. Nobody talked. Nobody said anything. It was just absolute silence the whole 24 hours of the Sabbath day. It's just garbage, Brother Jesus Christ. It's other garbage. These people re reject Jesus Christ to the King James Bible, the easy believism people. They reject the true plan of salvation because they love their sin. They love their flesh. They love the, the ways of this world. And they ain't getting saved for nobody. They love it. Right? You got people coming in telling these Thessalonians, you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. And in the time, and they read letters. Here's the thing: you're going in the time of Jacob's trouble, and I'm getting ahead of myself again. But they're reading letters from the brethren on the time of Jacob's trouble. What's it about? What's going on in the time of Jacob's trouble? It's a very fearful time. It's a scary, scary, fearful time. And then they're being told they're going into that time period where you have to endure to the end to be saved. You mean I can lose my salvation? They start questioning whether they, they are, they're eternally secure. That would trouble you in spirit big time. Okay? And Paul in both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is com comforting them with the truth that the body of Christ does not go in the time of Jacob's trouble and that in the time of, Je in the, time of the Gentiles we are sealed into the day of redemption. He has to reassure them, hey, you're sealed. We're not going through that time period. But there still be some that trouble you. Remember that in the Bible? There should be some that trouble you. And then in another book, there would be some that trouble you. Someone's always trying to come in, wolves in sheep's clothing. People are always trying to come in, pretending to be one of us, and trying to scare us and mess us up. Troubled by words. Remember, neither by spirit. What about words? Troubled in words. People coming in. Acts 15.24. Turn to Acts 15.24. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with 
words. Subverting your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. This is in Acts. You have to be, you have to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. You gotta get saved, but you also gotta do this. In other words, you, you don't know if you're saved. You gotta merit salvation. You gotta earn salvation. If you fail this, you can lose salvation. They have troubled you with words, subverting your soul. For Thessalonians, I believe they're telling them you go into this time period, and in this time period, there's works added. It's not just the faith. It's not just repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. You also have to obey commandments of God. And, what, and the commandments of God is don't take the mark and worship the beast. It goes hand in hand. You do one, you do the other. You don't have to do them, period. Now there's works involved. you got to earn it, salvation. Right. So bring your soul saying you must be circumcised. Turn to Romans chapter 16, verse 8. So people are coming in with words that are contrary to the words of the Bible. What God teaches us. There's some people who come in and they'll take things out of context. Things that are for different dispensations. And try to apply them to today. Romans 16, 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We're back to this verse again, brothers and sisters Christ. You say, well, you've mentioned this a lot in your Bible studies. I have to keep mentioning this. Brothers and sisters Christ, how do you keep from being simple? Are you taking God's word? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify him through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We're not only supposed to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Do you know this book? Do you start your day with this book? And do you end your day with this book? Now, brothers and sisters Christ, if you're a babe in Christ, you're newly saved, do you need to start this a day with this book and end the day with this book starting in the Pauline epistles? Start in the book of Romans, chapter 1, and go through the Pauline epistles, and go through them several times. Get them here. Why? Because when someone comes around with good words, it doesn't matter. I'm not simple. God's helped me hide this word in my heart. Be gone. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. You're not a servant of Satan. Be gone. Tell me that repentance is a work. Be gone. Tell me prayer is a work. Be gone. Tell me I can lose my salvation or I have to earn salvation. Be gone. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. Be gone. Uh, that if the Trinity is absolute truth and God and three persons and, and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit going against the Godhead of the King James Bible. Be gone. Oh, the Bible... For this situation, the church goes into the time of Jacob's trouble, but we got to change the title of the time of Jacob's trouble. we got to make it, hmm, look at, oh, the Great Tribulation, because then we can take Jacob out of it and make it about the church. Be gone! I'm not a simpleton. Be gone! How are most people deceived today, brother says Christ, by good words and fair speeches? Because they don't know this book, the Word of God, God's perfect written Word, like they should know it. And they rely on men behind a camera or men behind a pulpit to tell them what it says because they're not reading it and studying it for themselves. And when someone comes along, and I've already told you this, but I failed, I failed this. Someone comes along with a good teaching that sounds good, and I end up parroting something that's not in the Bible. And I'm working on that, brothers and Christ. I'm working on it. PWC, Polly Wanna Cracker. It sounds good, but I didn't know the Bible enough to say, hey, that's wrong. It's not in the Bible. I'm learning to study now. Was it trust but verify? When someone says something, you verify it. You'd be like the Bereans. They check the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. When someone comes along and tells you something, you verify it through the scriptures. Okay. But simple. People are coming in. And they're saying, hey, this, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's these letters from that's true. These are good letters. That's speaking prophecy and speaking truth about the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's very scary. It's very fearful. 
And then these people come in with good words and fair speeches. The body of Christ goes in that. We go into that time period. And they start forgetting. If you, like I said, 1 Thessalonians, Paul warns them, you're not going through it. Then you get to 2 Thessalonians. He writes another letter to them saying, I told you, you're not going through it. Why do you have to do that? Because someone comes in and gets them fearful thinking they're going to have to go through it. And he's got to write them again. I told you, you're not listening to my words, Paul's saying. You're listening to someone else's words. Good words and fair speeches. You're being troubled in spirit and by words. Don't be troubled by spirit and by words. Okay. Ephesians 4.30, once again, And grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed into the day of redemption. One of the biggest ways you can be troubled in the spirit is losing loved ones, losing brothers and sisters in Christ to the world, where the falling away, where they're going the way of the world. You lose lo loved ones that are lost. And one of the biggest grievances in your spirits is when you start thinking that I'm, use I'm not serving the Lord, I'm not pleasing the Lord, maybe I'm not saved, and you start getting the de uh, grieving the Holy Spirit. Okay. I can't make it, Lord. How many of you had that? Where you're like, I don't know if I can make it, Lord. We don't have to endure to the end, and then we shall be saved. But we're supposed to be looking to that blessed hope. We're supposed to be running a race as if one receiveth the prize. You start the race, you finish the race. How many of you sit there and go, Lord, I've done it before. Lord, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of this, and I'm tired of that. And, and Lord, the body of Christ is so divided right now, and there's just a lot of bitterness and hate in the body of Christ, and people are getting so messed up when it comes to doctrine and the Word of God, because we have all these wolves in sheep's clothing coming in, and I'm tired of fighting the good fight. And the, I had a sister in Christ warn me and say, hey, through the scriptures, not warning, but she was encouraging me, through the scriptures, saying, the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing. And now that God has hidden his word in my heart, I do this a lot, Brothers Christ, now that God's hidden his word in my heart, I'll say, Lord, I'm just too tired. And then it hits me in my head, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Yes, Lord, I know, I know, but you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm very weary. And then I remember that verse, and I, I'm still trying to memorize it, but it talks about how he renews our spirit daily, day by day. We, we were given a renewed spirit day by day. Uh, then Jesus, uh, God reminds me that if any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily. It's a day-to-day -day thing. Our life for Jesus Christ down here, especially in these last days, it's a day-to-day -day thing. And he shows the scriptures, and the scriptures encourage me, strengthen me, I get back up, and I get back to serving the Lord. Right? But what grieves us, we can have things that grieve our spirits. I don't know if I can make it. In that time period, I can tell you right now, brothers and Christ, in that time period, I don't know if I can make it. I don't go into that time period. I don't have to worry about it. But when you start getting people to think, hey, you might be going into that time period. I don't know if I can make that, Lord. That's a horrible time period. It's fearful. I already fell you now. I can't imagine then. I'm not talking about like just being a hardcore failure, but I'm just saying, Brother Christ, how many of us can raise our hand and says, since I was a babe in Christ to being a mature Christian, I fell on my face many times. How many of us have done that? I have. I've fallen on my face plenty of times. I've failed the Lord plenty of times. I've made mistakes. I've wronged brethren. I did wrong by the lost world by not preaching the truth to them. The gospel of salvation. The gospel of my salvation. There's times that I've failed the Lord. And you, and you get talked about going into that time period. It's scary. It's scary. It's going to trouble you in spirit, and then they're going to be troubling you with words. They start messing the Word of God up and messing with it to make it sound like we're going through. Or, oh, no, we're going through. No, we're not. Paul says we're not. How about this one? Shaken in mind. Okay. Shaken in mind. Let's get back to shaken in mind, the first one, part, where it says that you be soon, that you... Be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit. We talk about trouble, spirit, and why Paul would say, do not be shaken in mind. But what about shaken in mind itself? How can someone be shaken in mind? Titus chapter 2, verse 11. How do you, I'm sorry, not how can they be shaken in mind. We already talked about that. How do you encourage someone so they're not shaken in mind? Especially with this situation here. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of our God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all all 
men. Not just some, okay? Not the elect, okay? As far as only some people are destined to go to heaven and some people are destined to go to hell. You don't have a choice. No, salvation has to appear to all men. Anyone can get saved today. Twelve, teaching that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Notice there's, there's a dot comma. There's more to the, to the thought here. Okay. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. How do you look for that blessed hope? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what it means to look for that blessed hope. When you take away... Oh, here's another way to trouble people. Oh, Jesus isn't coming any day soon. There is no imminent return of Jesus Christ. That's going to ruin your walk. That's going to mess up your walk with the Lord. Because this walk right here is based 100% off looking for that blessed hope. I don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. He could come back today. I need to live for Him today. I need to make sure my life lines up with Him, that He's pleased, His Word, line up with His Word, that He's pleased with me. I want Jesus to say, well done, thou good and faithful one. I don't want Him to be on a fallen state, falling flat on my face when Jesus comes back. I'm supposed to be looking with that for that blessed hope to happen any day now with the life that I'm living. It's a motivator to live a life of Christ. You know what takes away that motivation? Oh, Jesus isn't coming back for another like four or five years, seven years. Give it would take ten years. No, worry, don't worry about looking for Jesus Christ. Just keep your eyes on the world. And let's get distracted by what's going on in the world. Oh, yeah. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Here it is. Here's how you defeat shaken in mind. Verse 15. These things speak and exhort. We stay in the Word of God. There's epistles that say, make sure you're reading this epistle all the time. Make sure you're reading this book all the time. You know what helps us when we get shaken in mind? We read the Word of God. Back here, it's the spoken word, then it gets written down, and today we have the written word. Okay. These things speak, listening and hearing the Word. The Word of God is meant to be spoken, it's meant to be seen, read, it's meant to be heard. That's how you get rid of the shaken in mind. And exhort, you have brethren that encourage one another. Stick to the book. Thessalonians, you have Paul. God, brothers and sisters Christ, we're not going into that time period. Don't be shaken in mind. We're not going into that time period. That's a comfort. He's exhorting them. And rebuke with all authority. You make sure to get the false teachings out. Rebuke it. You're not welcome. Like I said, get out of here. Be gone. You're not welcome. Keep truth in the body of Christ. Get the wickedness and lies and, and false teachings and doctrines of devils. Get them out. Today, it just seems like the wolves in sheep's clothing are coming in, and they're getting good teachings, true doctrines. They're getting the body of Christ to kick those out and take in doctrines of devils. What are we in? We're in the falling away. People are falling away from the truth of God. They're handing this over. You remember Esau with the pottage. Take the message of pottage. Take the birthright. I want the message of pottage. Take, take the birthright. Go ahead and take this. I, I want the flesh. I, I'm going to go back to the flesh. Go ahead and take this. and I, I'm going to go back to the world and worldliness. I want to go back to doing things the world's way and the flesh's way. They start turning their back on the truth. That's where the rebuke comes in with all authority. we got to make sure that this is our final authority, chapter and verse, and we're doing things God's way. Brothers, this is Christ. That's so important in these last days. The, those of us that are still standing and aren't falling flat on our face, giving in to the lust of the flesh, the three enemies, the flesh, the world, and Satan, we haven't given in to those three. We're doing our best to stand. It's not always easy. We need to keep the bad stuff out. Is it going to be a lonely road in these last days? I've already done studies on that, Brother Servette. It gets lonely. It does. In these last days, it gets lonely. We're spread out. 
The body of Christ is fighting, and it's like you, there's times where you just have to be like, I'm sorry, I'm done with you. I'm sticking with the Word of God, and I'm staying on the straight and narrow path. You're getting distracted, and you're going off to the left, and you're going off to the right. You're not staying on the straight path. I can't join you. I can't go the direction you're going. I'm following this. And there's times I've had to be corrected, Brother Sykes. I've been rebuked and corrected by brethren. Amen. Amen. To get me back, I started getting sidetracked to the left or the right. Or I was ignorant and being, I was taught a lie and I didn't have the truth. And they revealed, they showed me the truth. My Holy Spirit bared witness with the Holy Spirit that's in them. And that's truth. And I was corrected. I was rebuked. Let no man despise thee. You know where the despising comes in? This is a whole other teaching. But the despising comes in when you have people that are double-minded. They say one thing and do another. Hypocrites. So you have hypocrites and you have double-minded people. He's saying, these things speak. Stay consistent. Stand for the truth. Don't waver. Don't faint. Don't falter. And then no man will despise thee. Why do men despise them? Because you have people that are compromising. They're showing themselves to be hypocrites. They say one thing and then start doing another. Then they change their wording a little bit. Well, I didn't really mean that. And, and then... What is it? It's compromising. It's just compromising. It is starting to warm up. The sun's coming out. <laughs> but it's compromising. This is where our hearts and minds are supposed to be focused on, brothers and Christ. Once again, I want to point this out. Our hearts and mind is not supposed to be focused on the world and what's going on in the world. Our hearts and minds are not supposed to be focused on the time of Jacob's trouble, a time period we're not going to be going through. Our hearts and minds are supposed to be focused on that blessed hope Living the life of Jesus Christ, being ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation, sanctification, being a servant to our brothers and sisters in Christ, being a servant to God first, but being a, secondly, being a servant to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thirdly, preaching the, uh, loving the lost world by preaching the gospel to them. That's where our love starts for them, that's where our love ends for them. Okay? We don't render evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. Our life as a Christian living for Jesus Christ until he comes back to take us home, that's where our focus is supposed to be. That's where our hearts and minds are supposed to be, brothers and sisters Christ. Living for Jesus Christ every day, no matter what, no matter what, no matter what happens in this world, brothers and sisters Christ, no matter how bad this world gets, it doesn't change the mission. It doesn't change how we're supposed to live. Remember the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new going on that changes this at all. There's nothing that's going to go on out there that we're going to have to go, oh, well, now we've got to change how God told us how to do things. No. We're supposed to stick with how God told us how to do things. We're supposed to stick with the mission of the ministry of reconciliation. Sanctification. Pleasing God. Nothing in this world changes that. But you have men coming in, brothers and Christ, I believe in Thessalonians, you have men coming in and saying, hey, we're going to get you distracted by the world. And we're going to get you distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble, a time period that you're not going through, but we're going to kind of get you to think you're going to go through it and start doubting whether you go through it or not. And then get you all the way over to just being messed up and believing that you're going into that time period. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 how do you get that shoon be, not be soon shaken in mind? That troubled spirit, being troubled in words and spirit, how do you fix that? What we're doing right here, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Remember, this is 1 Thessalonians. He's having to tell them. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of our Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which is our sleep. Now there for a while when I was a babe in Christ, learning about the time of Jacob's trouble and the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, we were all like, we want to live to see the time of Jacob's trouble as if we don't get to be alive when the catching away of the body of Christ happens, we're going to miss the catching away. But this is Christ, that's not true. Everyone, all the way to Paul, Peter, John, Titus, 
Silas, Stephen that was stoned, Barnabas that fell away, Demas having forsaken me, having loved this present world. All these brethren, whether they were in a standing point or they fell away, all these brethren going all the way back to the early church, 2,000 years to today, every one of them gets to see the catching away. We're all a part of it. Whether we be dead in Christ, we're up in, in heaven right now. Like, not us, but we have brothers and sisters of Christ that are up in heaven right now. They died being saved in Christ Jesus. Okay? We all get to see that catching away. That's what this is saying. Remember, the dead in Christ rise first, then we which remain shall be caught up with them to be with them in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The dead in Christ rise first. Everybody gets to see it. Everybody does. So, that's a comfort. If it doesn't happen in my lifetime, it doesn't happen in my lifetime. But I'm to live as if it could. That's the whole point of that imminent return of Jesus Christ. You live every day as if it could happen. Because you don't want that catching you by surprise. Being caught up in death by surprise. And Oh, you didn't do much for the Lord. Here's your penny. I remember talking about that. The judgment seat of Christ with the fire. All your works go on the fire. Everything gets burnt up. And the only thing that survives is a penny. Here's your penny. You were too distracted by the world. You were too distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble. You were too distracted by the flesh. Living after the flesh instead of living after the spirit. You, you, the Bible says God knows them that are his. In God's house there's not only gold and silver, but wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. Are you that dishonor? Here's your penny. Or are you that honor? Here's your rewards. Well done, thou good and faithful one. Well done. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Everybody gets to see the catching away. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 18. Wherefore... Comfort one another with these words. Why would Paul have to say that? The same reason he had to say that you should not be shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Someone's coming in and stealing that comfort. Their assurance of the blessed hope. To catch away the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, and it can happen any day. And that's what we're supposed to look for, and that's what we're supposed to live for. This isn't it. That's a hope. Thank God this life isn't it. We have an eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is 1 Thessalonians. Now he also says, letter from us. Why would he say letter from us? Some people will say, well, some people were writing letters and putting Paul's name on it. No, that's not what I believe is going on here. I believe why he says letter from us is because there are brethren that are writing letters. Uh, Revelation is a letter by John unto the churches talking about the time of Jacob's trouble and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's, it's very scary. That time period is very scary. The day of the Lord, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God sometimes. Here we have, Revelation writes about, uh, John writes about today going into the time of Jacob's trouble. The people are going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. He gets caught up and he gets to see everything that goes on in the time of Jacob's trouble. Then he gets to see the day of the Lord, and then he gets to see the new heaven and the new earth, and he writes this all down. It's a letter from, a, from the body of Christ, from an apostle. Okay. When he says us, Paul's an apostle, John's an apostle. Okay. Uh, you also have First and Second Peter. Okay. Now, some people will disagree. I, I believe that by the time you get to Second Peter, it's definitely the time of Jacob's trouble. Denying the Lord that bought you and going to hell. Uh, no. Today you can get frustrated with the Lord and say I'm done and walk away and then come back. I've known uh, testimonies where people are like, I just they got they hit that first wall and they just crumble and their walk with the Lord, they hit that first wall. We all have walls that we hit that we have to over that God gives us the strength to overcome. Tribulation in this life, hard times, frustrations. Okay. The, we can overcome. Some hit it and just, they don't come up. You can get mad and walk away for a few minutes. God's still there with you. He didn't leave you. He's, he's here. And then you come back to God and go, Lord, I'm sorry. 
But in that time period, you deny the Lord that bought you. You go to hell. You take the mark, you worship the beast, you just denied the Lord that bought you. But the point is, is that's a whole other study, but you have First and Second Peter. That's a letter from an apostle. Peter is an apostle. You say he's an apostle to the Jews. But he also witnessed to some Gentiles in the book of Acts. He's still an apostle. It's a letter from us. He's still part of the body of Christ. Hebrews. Okay. James. All right. There are some books, that, that letters from the, the, the brethren that talk about the time of Jacob's trouble. That scary time period. He says, letter as from us. You don't have to turn here, but Galatians 1.20 says, Now the things which I rate unto you, behold, before God I lie not. 1 Thessalonians 5.1 But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. 2 Peter, here's Peter, 2 Peter 3.1 This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, and both which I stir up you, stir up your pure minds by the way of remembrance. He's reminding them. But I write unto you. 1 John 1, 4, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. 2 John 1, 12, Having many things to write unto you. So when we read there, nor by letter is from us, I believe he's talking about, there are some letters that are talking about the time of Jacob's trouble and how horrifying it is, and you've got wolves in sheep's clothing taking those letters saying, see, 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 you're going to have to go through that time period. And they ignore the, the scriptures, the letters, the part of the letters where it says we don't go through that time period. They'll ignore that and just say, oh, we're going through that time period. We're going to go over in, uh, what is it, Matthew 24, um, I think, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to go over there and we're going to grab that and we're going to say that's for us. It's for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble, Jacob's trouble, but we're going to change the title to the Great Tribulation, take Jacob out of it completely, replacement theology, the church has replaced Israel. No, we not. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Okay? But they're going to try to do everything they can and mess. they take letters from the Gospels and they try to make out, okay, that's about us and we're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. He says, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is at hand. Don't be deceived, don't be deceived by wolves and sheep's clothing, and don't be fearful by some of the letters that we have here that talk about the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not going through that time period. Okay? What's the day of Christ? This is another disagreement with some of the body of Christ. Uh, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, eh, they're the same thing. No, they're not. No, they're not. But let's stop here for those who've turned their back on the eminent return. Because this verse here debunks anybody who says there is no eminent return. They're against an eminent return. They just call Paul a liar. They just call God a liar. When he says that the day of Christ is at hand. Well, the day of Christ is really the day of the Lord. And it's when Jesus comes back at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Let's go with that for a second, brothers and Christ. Let's go with that. If that is at hand, by default, since the time of Jacob's trouble hasn't happened, then the time of Jacob's trouble has to be even more imminent. Because if Jesus coming back, the day of the Lord, is at hand, the time of Jacob's trouble for its starting has to be at hand, even closer. And since the time of Jacob's trouble hasn't happened yet, we know the catch and way of the body of Christ happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's even more imminent. Yes? By default? See, their logic still fails. The catch and way of the body of Christ is still imminent, and it can happen any day. But that's not what this is talking about. The day of Christ is the catch and way of the body of Christ. The day of the Lord is when Jesus Christ, we get to come back with Him. Those who, rule, those who suffer with Him, if you suffer with me, that if you suffer for me, you shall also reign with me. Suffer for him, you shall also reign with him. Okay? Those who suffer in this life, okay, running that race that I talked about, you start it, you finish it, but a lot of brethren aren't going to finish it. Why? They're getting distracted by the flesh, by the world, by Satan and his wolves and sheep's clothing coming in to mess up the word of God and get you all messed up. You don't, there's a lot of brethren, I believe, in these last days, the falling away, they're not going to finish the race. It's not about finishing first, although you run as if only one receiveth the prize. But it's, to me, it's about finishing the race in these last days. 
Are you going to, how do you finish the race? When Jesus Christ comes back and calls us home, are you in a standing position? Doing the work of the Lord, living for Him and doing things His way. That's finishing the race. Okay? But the day of Christ is the catching away of the body of Christ. Okay? How do we know that? Well, what was in verse 1? Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. That day is at, that, that event is the day of Christ and it's at hand. You say, oh, come on, that, you, you have to be a little bit more better because getting the context for some people, they don't want the context. Okay, we just got the context. Okay, now let's do comparing Scripture with Scripture. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.8. Who shall also confirm you unto the end. End of what? The time of the Gentiles. Until the time of the Gentiles be come in. That ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus calls us home, are you going to be blameless? Are you going to be falling flat on your face? To be blamed. Why weren't you in a standing position? Uh, that's kind of weak because it says the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay, it has the word Lord in it. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. These are warnings that we're... We don't go through the time of Jacob's trouble, brother, says Christ. So this day that it's talking about that we have to confirm you to the end, to that day, is the catching away of the body of Christ. We are sealed until, until the day of redemption. That day of redemption is the catching away of the body of Christ. We're confirmed until that, until we get caught up. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The word Lord is not even mentioned there. Being confident of this very thing. We're supposed to be confident of the catching away of the body of Christ. And we're not going into that time of Jacob's trouble. Absolutely. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until so you get caught home in death, or get caught home in life. But like I said, even the ones that get caught home in death before the catching away of the body of Christ, we all get to be there for the day of Christ. Everyone gets to experience it. The dead in Christ rise first. Turn to Philippians 1.10. Here we see it again. That ye may approve things, approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The catching away of the body of Christ. Till so you get called home, either in death or in life. Are you without offense? Something to think about, brothers says Christ. Philippians 2.16. Philippians 2.16. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. There you have it, day of Christ. Complete match to what we just read there, that the day of Christ is at hand. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Run in vain? You're supposed to be running a race as if one receiveth the prize? That's the finish line. The catch away of the body of Christ. That's the finish line, brother says Christ. Are you running that race? Are you going to make it to the end in a standing position? Or are you going to be one of the brothers and sisters in Christ that's fallen flat on their face? That's turning their back on this book. They're becoming very worldly. They have idolatry in their life. Lust of the flesh. Compromising to please the world. To please themselves. They start falling into doing things uh, Satan's way and turning their back on God's way. The three enemies. You're running a race, brothers and Christ. I always picture this in my head. When you're picturing when the Bible talks about running that race, imagine a track. Not a circle track, although sometimes it feels like we're just doing circles because we're supposed to live every day, read your word of God, pray, everything. But imagine a track that just keeps going and you can't see where it ends. But you know it ends, and it's, it's done in a way where you, it turns and turns and turns. The track's not straight. Let's make it turn. Why? Because around the next corner could be the, the finish line. 
Oh, it's not here. Around that next corner can be the finish line. But you've got this track, and as you're running along this track, guess what's on the sides? You have all these worldly vendors. And they're all yelling, hey, check this out. Hey, check that out. We're supposed to be running a race. And some of the brethren, they're running, and they turn around. Oh, hey, that looks kind of neat. And they stop running, and they walk over to the vendor, whatever the world's trying to offer, lust of the flesh, worldliness, this, that. And you start looking for a little bit. I've done it. I'm guilty. I stopped running, and I got distracted. And then God's like, get back on the track. I'm like, okay, I'm done with you. Back on the track. i got to get back to running. We're running a race. That's what the Lord kind of gives me that image when it talks about running. And when you're running a race, okay, you make sure you're not doing it in vain. It's not in vain. That sister in Christ, I, I bless her heart. Um, that uh, do not get weary in well-doing. Don't get weary in it. Don't believe it's vain that you're living a life of Christ. And living a life of Christ is going to cost you your friends. Your lost friends, your lost family members. The world's not going to be best, best, best buds with you. You're supposed to, the Bible says, if it be possible, live peacefully among all men. I live peacefully among my neighbors. I've witnessed to them. I've given them um, these things. Uh, booklets on how to be saved and know it. Um, uh, gospel tracts. Okay? And I help them out and they help me out sometimes. Live peaceably. But we're not best buds. We're not that friend that's closer than a brother. Okay. I pray for him. But I'm running a race, Brother Sister Christ. Are you running that race? Or are you one of those people that get stopped by a vendor? Oh, I'm going to go over here and talk to this one for a little while. Oh, it's okay if I take a break for a, for a second. It's okay if I let down my guard for a second. The worst thing God can do is give you, I always say this, Brothers Christ, the worst thing God can do is give you everything you could possibly want down here. Why? Because then you'd be so distracted you wouldn't be running that race at all. And I know brethren that used to run in ministry that ran that race hardcore and they started accumulating all this wealth and all this stuff down here and now they don't run the race as hardcore as they used to run it when, when they didn't have these things, when they were poor. You hear these stories all the time. When they were poor, they were just on fire for the Lord. Now they're distracted, and they're not as on fire for the Lord like they used to be. I've seen that happen. The day of Christ, brothers and sisters, in Christ, is the catching away of the body of Christ. Don't let anybody deceive you by saying, oh, no, it's not that. It's something else. No, it's the catching away of the body of Christ. And it says that that day is at hand. You know what it means to be at hand, brothers and sisters, Christ? Eminent. It can happen any day. We don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to, it could happen any day. Are you ready? I've said this before. I know brethren that used to be, are you ready? And when they saw something bad happening in the world, because the world, the Antichrist spirit's even in the world today, and I believe that Antichrist spirit is preparing the lost world, those who reject the truth, over and over and over. It's preparing the world and getting things set up for the time of Jacob's trouble. I do. I believe that. I can see things out there. I see it going on. Okay. It is. But you've got brethren that when they used to look at the world and see how bad it's getting and how it's being prepared for the time of Jacob's trouble, guess what happens before the time of Jacob's trouble? The catching away of the body of Christ. And they would see what's bad that's going on in the world, and they'd come to us, brother says Christ, and encourage us. You see what's going on? The time, any day now, any day now. Time, time's running out. I always use that. Time's running out. Now's the day of salvation. Behold, now's the accepted time. Behold, now's the day of salvation. That's what the Bible says. Now's the time to get saved when it comes to the lost world. Time's running out. We're not going to be here that much longer. And that's a motivator to live for Jesus Christ. It's supposed to be a good motivator too to, to get people saved. Time, look how bad the you look at you tell them look how bad the world's getting. Time's running out. You need to get saved. You go into that time period. As we get into this study, I believe most of the people that go into that time period are going to take the mark and worship the beast. They're going to fall for that great delusion. They're going to worship the beast and take the mark, worship the beast, and they're going to be damned to hell. 